voting, as many of our listeners know, many of our viewers know, is a preferential choice voting method. Used when more than two candidates run for office, instead of voting for just one candidate, you can rank all of the candidates in your order of preference. Candidates then who receive the fewest number of votes are eliminated, eliminated excuse me, until one candidate emerges with an actual majority. Proponents argue the method allows for smaller parties, lesser known candidates to run for office. Ranked choice voting is used to decide national elections in other countries, the U.S., primarily only used in some local or statewide elections. In 2020, the state of Maine used ranked choice voting for the general presidential election, the first state ever to do it. And in 2020, ranked choice voting initiatives were on the ballot in two states, Massachusetts and Alaska. Massachusetts initiative was defeated by a 55 to 45 margin. Alaska, however, saw a different outcome. To talk about that, we do have Scott Kendall and Jonathan Christ Tompkins to talk about it. In Alaska, one of the bill's primary authors was, in fact, Alaska State Representative Jonathan Christ Tompkins. And we'll start with him. How you doing, sir? Hi, I'm I'm doing well. Um, Although, although just a just a quick quick clarification, I I have been pretty involved in a lot of uh, elections policy in Alaska. Although, I think a lot of the authorship credit for the initiative goes to to Scott for the initiative. Well, Scott, we'll say thank you to you. But we'll still Scott. Well, I guess we'll start with Scott then. Scott, how'd you get involved in? It? How'd you decide it was a priority for you? Um, you know, it's it's sort of it goes back to the the evolution my career took. Um, I'm a attorney, um, worked primarily for Republican candidates. I'd done work for, at one point, Alaska's entire congressional delegation, uh, Senator Stevens, uh, Senator Murkowski, Congressman Young, I'd done work here and there. Um, but I'd also had the opportunity in 2010, for example, I was Senator Murkowski's campaign counsel on her write-in campaign, where she had lost the Republican primary and ran against both the Republican Dem- and Democratic candidates as a write-in candidate and won. Um, I also worked for former Governor Bill Walker, and Governor Walker was a former Republican who ran as an independent against the Republican, um, was almost certain to lose because there was a Democrat, Republican, and independent in the race, and he and the Democratic candidate combined their ticket. Right before the election, he became the candidate for governor, the Democratic candidate for, for governor became the lieutenant governor candidate, and they won. And so I had seen um, Alaska sort of trying to buck the trend of partisanship. 62%, 63% of Alaskans don't affiliate with either major party. Say that percentage think, again, nearly two thirds. So, so not just a bare yeah. majority, but nearly two thirds uh, of Alaskans don't affiliate. Yeah, don't affiliate with either major party. We have a smattering of small parties, yeah. but the vast majority are nonpartisans or undeclareds as we call them. And so a very independent state that had multiple times kind of flexed its muscle um, to overcome the two-party system. And so um, I had worked for Governor Walker as his chief of staff through the end of his term in 2018. And early 2019, I just sort of said, you know, what are we doing here? Um, we, are, we are electing people that routinely um, don't, don't really satisfy or reflect the will of Alaskans. Why not a system that will? Um, kind of focused initially on the closed primary system and then built from there to the system that we drafted, which was um, it's a top four open primary. So you get on the ballot um, by finishing in the top four vote getters in an open primary, everyone on the same ballot, regardless of party affiliation, you make the general election ballot and then rank choice voting from there. And Scott, then you connected with Jonathan. You had been, Scott, you had been the chief of staff of what? Bill Walker, a former Alaska governor, not affiliated, nonpartisan Alaska governor. Uh, okay. And how did you connect with Jonathan? Eventually, or maybe I should say Representative Christ Tompkins, uh, you had to shop this, right? You needed to find a sponsor of some sort. Yeah, well, in Alaska, we actually don't have to have um, um, legislative support to put something on a ballot. We go gather signatures. Got it. Um, but I knew um, Representative Christ Tompkins well because we have a small legislature, only 60 total representatives and senators. So we're kind of like a big family when we're all down there in Juneau, have dinners together. And so uh, Rep. Christ Tompkins is well known for supporting ethics reform, all sorts of kind of good government issues. And, you know, fairly early on, he was one of my sounding boards. There was a lot of them across the political spectrum, Democrats, Republicans, independents, and and Jonathan was one of our kind of early supporters and validators on the left. 
um, and you know, a ton of appreciation for that for sure. So, Representative, how'd you get into this mess? Well, I, I like Scott share um, a lot of concern about uh, the sort of polarization of politics, and um, I mean, I've come at it from the other side of the aisle as Scott has, and um, I mean, one of the sort of unique features of the Alaska legislature, the House of Representatives specifically, is that um, right now in this present day, it's a little bit complicated if you fast forward a week or two, but in this present day, we have a, a bipartisan governing majority in the House of Representatives. Um, so I'm a Democrat. There's, oh gosh, 15 or so of us, I think is the present tally, and three independents, and then uh, we've got another five Republicans in our majority, which constitutes... So let's do the arithmetic numeric- on this. Let's do the arithmetic. So, so you do have a governing caucus, but that governing caucus is essentially a coalition government like we might see in we might see in Europe, and it's made up. And how many, how many members of the chamber total? 40 total in the House. Okay, four, there are 40 members of the House, and the governing majority the, uh, that selects the speaker, presumably, et cetera, just like everybody, you know, like in another state. You said, say those numbers again. You said 13 Democrats? 15. I, and I, th- I think I'm getting the math right because one Democrat is re-registered as an independent, and then sadly a Republican recently passed away. But I think it's 15 Democrats, three independents, and five Republicans. All right. So if I do the arithmetic correctly, that's 23 out of 40. That creates the majority. And then who is the minority? Is the minority also a bipartisan minority or is it Republicans? All Republicans. Got it. OK, so that so that majority caucus. Now, it would seem like that uh, that collection, that 15 plus four plus five, well, 15 plus three plus five, uh, 15 plus three plus five might they have been able to just refer to this to the ballot? Might they have been able to pass this? Or is this the kind of thing that could only happen in Alaska through a ballot initiative with signatures gathered by the people? I, I think really only by ballot initiative. And and Scott referenced um, good government and ethics reform um, policy that I'd previously been involved in. And um, I, I think it's safe to say from that experience, these sort of systems reform proposals they, they, I'm, I mean, it's, it's possible that we may, through some uh, incredible Herculean effort, may have been able to muster a simple majority of votes in one or possibly even both chambers. But there is no way that our current governor would have signed uh, a, a measure like this. And in fact, I think our current governor was hard over opposed to it on the ballot in the general election. So there's just there's just no way this was going to go through the legislative process. So Scott and his team um, put this through the initiative process and um, really sort of carried it forward from beginning to end and got the positive result. It's a similar dynamic now that's being discussed in our state. We live in Oregon, and right now there is a debate about whether there will be able to be a meaningful campaign finance limitation uh, bill passed through the legislative chambers and signed by the governor, or if, in fact, it's going to have to go to the ballot. So we're familiar with that dynamic. And so then how did you end up connecting with Scott? How did you decide this is something you were going to do and that you were going to work trying to gather those signatures and get this thing passed? Well, Scott was Scott was really the leader, and I, I was uh, I really just sort of came in and, and tried to sort of help out and and provide um, support and validation on on the the left of center spectrum in Alaska. So I mean, it was it was really a multipartisan coalition from afar. It was really impressive watching it come together. You know, you had former Governor Walker, whom Scott was chief of staff to, in support. Some really notable Republicans. Um, Democrats like myself coming out in support. And, and so um, I was just trying to sort of do my do my best to help uh, rally votes from from my side of the spectrum. Scott, when you got this thing started, what was the hardest part? What was the hardest thing to n- not even just get it passed, but achieve initial liftoff? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you had enough time talking to someone because it, it is a fundamental change, it's not a complicated change, but it's fundamental. Um, the biggest barrier I had was, okay, I finally got that individual I'm talking to, to the point where they agree this is better, but they're like, there's no way in hell you're getting this passed. It is simply impossible. So there was a belief gap and we had that gap, gosh, probably, um, right up until almost the primary elections, August of, of 2020. Um, because, you know, as you reflected, you know, trying to expect the legislators to pass this thing is almost impossible. So they're busy 
sometimes fighting with the other caucus, but large elements of both parties were opposed to this. So then they'd be fighting with their own party. They just couldn't, most legislators couldn't do it. I mean, there's, there's a brave few, um, Representative Christ Tompkins, the Speaker of the House, Bryce Edgman came out early, who really did. Um, but to kind of put it in perspective, um, we had both of the, the last candidates for governor, Mark Begich, former Senator Mark Begich, a Democrat, current Governor Dunleavy, representing 94% of the governor's vote, both of them came out against us. We had um, Planned Parenthood against us on one hand. We had Alaska Right to Life against us on the other hand. Every kind of political insider to some degree was against us. Um, but what I had seen sort of kind of historic looking was there were times in Alaska when we had our best governance was when we had coalitions in the legislature. And every time this happened, you'd see these, you know, the dysfunction would be too much and some moderates would come together, craft a coalition and do some good work. And every time reflexively, whether it's two years later, four years later, the primary comes and they primary all those folks who dared to smile at someone from the other party. And then you start over with harder core representatives and then you're back to square one. And then that's what happened. August, 2020, we had, um, I think it was nine Republicans targeted for elimination, so to speak. And I believe six of them lost. And these were not rhinos. These were um, John Coghill and Fairbanks. His father was one of the original Alaska Constitution signers, been in the legislature over two decades. The conservative's conservative, but a man who was going to work with a Democrat if he needed to to do the right thing. Senator Kathy Giesel, uh, Representative Chuck Kopp. I mean, all these people, they got wiped out. And all of a sudden, the public turned us because they were shocked that these people were losing to people who had no experience, no name recognition. The only thing they had was the party saying these people have to go. And so conservatism in Alaska has become less about any conservative ideals, and it's become 100 percent obedience to the party, obedience to the governor. And the public sort of woke up at that point, And then all of a sudden, the support started pouring in. They said, holy cow, what's happened? And these people have a solution. And I think about and this is probably jumping ahead a little bit. But right now, the country is uh, debating accountability about the current president of the United States. And one of the few Republicans in the United States Senate who is willing to have that conversation is your Republican U.S. Senator Lisa Murkowski. Now, she is her, her background makes that a little bit less surprising. She has often been she's often been the vote that, you know, Democrats have hoped, well, maybe she'll be with us and then we'll still fall short by a vote or two. And, the, you know, line, well, she'll be with us as long as we don't need her. Uh, but the, I also think about the uh, the different political dynamic that this puts her in or somebody else in Alaska. Does it, will this will this, by the way, impact uh, federal elections as well as state elections just cross the board everywhere. This is top to bottom every election run by the state. So that's federal and state. It's everything but our municipal elections will be run in this manner. So it, it, I don't know if this was your primary case, but it, but based on what you said, maybe it was the primary case. Like this allows somebody to uh, buck the party establishment on a given vote and think they have still got a chance to win is that the is that the basic argument or is that how you see it playing out and do you see that playing a role even right now in the dynamic around lisa murkowski not even saying necessarily her motives but maybe the kind of politics she faces going forward yeah yeah i mean what the the purpose was was to make every representative every elected official answerable to a majority of their constituents not to a party and not to five percent or ten percent of voters who show up to a closed primary and so that was achieved. I wouldn't in a million years take credit for Senator Murkowski's stand because she's been standing, um, uh, you know, when, when President Trump does something she agreed with, she would say that. And when he did something she disagreed with, um, she said that also. I mean, long before we passed this thing, President Trump promised to come primary her in 2022. But I think it shows that there is a better way. Um, because what we saw routinely was, you know, perhaps the things Senator Murkowski did that were in the public good, that were the things we'd be proudest of her for, were the things that were her political liabilities. She saved the Affordable Care Act. Um, she voted against Justice Kavanaugh when she became convinced we could do better. And rather than those things burnishing her credentials as they would with the general election populace, 
instead it became liabilities in a closed primary. And so now we have a system that's going to kind of reflect that large coalition that supported her when she ran as a write-in. Now they just won't have to spell her name. Jonathan, or, or would you, what do you prefer? Representative Christ Tompkins? What, what, how do you, my brother's name is Jonathan, by the way, same spelling. What is, uh, how do you prefer to be addressed? John, Jonathan is great. A lot easier to spit out. Where, as you see the political dynamics, and, and I'll probably go back to Scott also on this. Now, it doesn't surprise me. By the way, did Sarah Palin land somewhere on this one? I don't think we ever heard from her. All I right. don't know. Maybe someone did. So I heard from her, and I didn't hear from her on this, but I did hear from her on threatening to primary Lisa Murkowski in sort of an odd ranting uh, uh, video post. But I can understand why... Uh, why why somebody within some sectors of the Republican Party wouldn't like this idea, right? Where they say, no, no, our path to victory uh, to get, if we have some views that are out of step with the majority of Alaskans, but they're in step with a meaningful portion of Republicans, then I understand the arithmetic. I win Republican primary, and then I can still do my stuff, even if it's opposed to what a majority of Alaskans think. So I can understand that. What I what it's not as clear to me is why Planned Parenthood might oppose it. Uh, what were you hearing from your natural sort of political base, those who are opposed? It, what were their arguments? Why were they opposed? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. I definitely had some conversations with colleagues on this point, and um, I, I'm sure Scott can elaborate and add additional perspective. But um, I mean, there were some very notable Democrats whom I really respect and um, and agree with on on many issues. Who were uh, vocal opponents of the initiative, or remained neutral and and sort of had more private concerns. Um, I mean, one of one of the concerns that um, exists in the progressive community in Alaska is, um, in historically, to some extent, when vote splitting has occurred, kind of the inverse of what we've seen in Maine. Um, it's conservatives that have vote split and if progressives define, are, define vote split for folks yeah so say you've got a general election you've got three sort of credible candidates who have critical mass support and two of them more or less come from one side of the spectrum and the third comes from the other side of the spectrum and inherently in a vote splitting scenario the candidate who comes from the side of the spectrum that's not being split in half or in some fractional term is going to be advantaged, similar to how Paul LePage won election both the first and the second time in Maine with very meager pluralities because there were two left of center candidates on the ballot who are both viable. And so you're hearing from them what? If there's this vote splitting, then it, it, we actually benefit from that circumstance. We Democrats and your, your, your Democratic colleagues benefit from that circumstance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even if you go back to the 90s, um, are, are the last Democratic governor of Alaska, Tony Knowles, was elected in 1994 and re-elected in 1998, I believe. And in both instances, there was very much a three-way general election. And you had a official Republican nominee in those general elections. And then you had a um, sort of insurgent de facto Republican nominee who was running under a third-party banner. And um, basically, the Republicans split the vote, and Governor Knowles was able to win re-election in both instances um, in, in a way that he might have been very, very much challenged to win those elections if there was just a unified Republican base. So the thinking on the progressive side is like, oh, my gosh, like looking, looking back, you know, if there's ranked choice voting. Well, I don't know if Governor yeah, no, Knowles are, might have won. Yeah, their argument is, listen, our only chance to ever win in this state is if the Republicans put forward some just crazy person or they put somebody who's not quite crazy enough and the crazy people, the not crazy people are both in the ballot. They fight it out and then we get to be the one sane person on the ballot. If it's just one sane Democrat versus one sane Republican, the sane Republican is going to win every time. What was your response to that? Why did you support it anyway? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I think the state is changing. So even if one wants to take a, you know, ideological perspective on this, and I want the election system that's going to result in the most progressives winning, um, I, I, I think there's actually a lot of data and, and statistics, just the state is changing, and that uh, left of center candidates can have an increasingly fighting chance in statewide elections than um, they might have had in the 90s or the 2000s when it was basically a snowball's chance for a progressive in the general election. Um, but the second thing is I, I think 
what ranked choice voting does is it fundamentally changes the frame and the premise of an election and and this sort of two-party system of it's just going to be the sort of tete-a-tete showdown between the d and the r is is adjusted fundamentally and it creates space for someone to maneuver into the middle and be a center left candidate and have a better chance of winning so it, it's it's you kind of have to like undo the the sort of two party um, frame on on election strategy and and how you get to a plurality under ranked choice voting and to give a counter example in 2018, we elected a Republican governor who's still sitting in the office, Governor Dunleavy, and he's probably one of the three to five most conservative governors in America right now. And I would say, I, I would certainly bet money that in 2018, if we had a ranked choice voting system, Governor Dunleavy may well not have been elected, even if he were the only Republican running on that ballot, because under an RCV system, I think either a lot of people's like fifth choice. Exactly, exactly. And there was two left of center candidates, Mark Begich and Bill Walker. And I think under an RCV system, one of them would have emerged as the winner because Governor Dunleavy had seated just so much of the political middle in Alaska and would have failed to win under an RCV system. Scott, let's continue back to you and let's continue on this sort of gaming it analysis, right? Like anybody you ask, the people, the, the people you're trying to get endorsements from, or you're not even talking to them, but they're deciding to where they stand anyway, who are within the political uh, arena, right? Who are running for stuff or consulting uh, or, or are major donors who have, who have something at stake. They are not behind a Rawlsy of a Rawlsy and veil of ignorance, right? They, they are thinking about how it's going to impact them, their electoral chances, the chances of them passing their priorities, et cetera. What were the, how do you see some of that dynamics changing now or some of the arguments you were hearing as people were trying to game it? Hey, this is going to hurt, you know, kind of like the Planned Parenthood question I asked, what were some of that that you were hearing or seeing? Yeah, and I and I came at it from a strange place. Um, yeah, you probably want to a, avoid the gaming. I mean, I, I'm yeah. not sure the argument was saying no, no, no. It's not about the games; it's about democracy. And I get that, and I want to say that, but I still understand that if the only thing we are, are sort of policy nerds, and we're we're not also thinking about the political dynamics, we're not, you know, probably paying attention to the dynamics that you were facing. Right, right. And so, you know, as, as a premise, you know, I'm not a Democrat. I didn't see it as my job to get more Democrats elected. Sure. Up until two days ago, I was a Republican. But I voted for Republicans. So two Democrats. days ago, because this, because this will be because this is taped until two days ago. What in the, in the aftermath of the Washington D.C. and you know, sort of seditious riots? Yeah, I, I waited. You know, took a breath um, to see what the national and state GOP response would be to what you know to me hit me in the way nine eleven hit me. Yeah. Um, and the response was not appropriate. Yeah. Um, there are certainly many brave Republicans, Mitt Romney. Ben Sass, Lisa Murkowski saying the right things. The party That's structure. Three. Yeah. The party structure itself. Um, it, it is not, you know, Trumpism is a disease and they have not rejected it. And if this didn't get them to reject it, then, um, you know, it, it's impossible um, to align my values with those values because there are no values. Um, so that's. I guess that's an aside, um, but I voted. You know, no, but in we're my talking life, about the essence of the country, the es- not only your background and how you're approaching this, but also the essence of what's going to happen. If the only thing we do is game for political power, and that's the only, and that was what essentially my question relates to. If that's the only thing we do, the democracy is doomed, right? And, and if right. we don't have any shared values, we don't have any shared standards, no shared principles. If it is only a game for, uh, and and nobody pleases themselves, and it's only a game for who can wield power, then not we shouldn't even be having this conversation, and not many other conversations other than a raw fight for power. Right, and so my whole goal really was to create a system that couldn't be gamed like that was that was literally my thought because in alaska not only we have you know three-way races and all sorts of interesting things we actually have a situation where both parties candidates from both parties will try to entice in a candidate you know a a green party candidate to hurt the democrat on the one side and alaska libertarian independence party or a libertarian candidate to hurt the republican on the other side and my my gut feeling was if you don't have a message to bring to 50% plus one, then you shouldn't be running. That was just where I started from. Maybe that's my personal, even though I'm a campaign attorney of you know, 15, 16 years, um, and I should be more cynical than that, that was my belief. Um, and so I look at a state like Alaska, 
well over 60%, probably 65%, closing on 70% of Alaskans are pro-choice, for example. We're a very libertarian, privacy-heavy state. We legalize marijuana. At the same time, we elect candidate after candidate that's contrary to those views because, you know, the national democratic politics are, are against resource development. We're a resource state and Alaskans vote their paycheck and then get something they don't really and by want. resource development. You mean what, like drilling and and and, and cutting, et cetera? Yes. Oil, oil and gas primarily, yeah. certainly. But 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 other resource development as well. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I've watched Democrats dance with the spoiler effect. Well, if we get this guy and if, if we get a candidate on the Republican side that's crazy enough, then we'll beat him. Then we'll have the power. And then we get someone like Governor Dunleavy, who is so far right of any governor or statewide elected official we've ever had in the state. I would sort of say, here is the failure leg of that strategy. You end up with someone who many Republicans revile. People in the middle don't. I mean, this is a person who proposed out of the gate, I'm going to cut the university system 40%. I'm going to cut K-12 40%. I'm going to all but shut down the marine highway system. I mean, stuff that no no one from any perspective would do. You know, I don't know a lot of conservatives that say, you know, gutting education is the way to economic success. It makes no sense. But this is where he was coming from. You know, he he believed government didn't work and he was going to break it to prove it to you. So that was where I came from. And, um, so, and I so also go, so Governor Governor Dunleavy, you think his presence was this thing passed close, right? I mean, what, thirty eight hundred votes or something? Yeah, it was real close. It was fifty point five to forty. You know, a one percent win. Okay, essentially. So, but a half point swing. So, is it your thought that the the, the sort of happenstance or the the context of the uh, the the ultra conservative use the term you want governor that you currently have was that worth a half a point to you? I mean, was that part of the dynamic here? Is people were like, hey, listen, this can't be the way Alaska goes. I think that was a factor for sure, yeah. uh, particularly in getting kind of those grass top supporters. I mean, I know because I saw our internal data is that support for the reforms was much higher. Support was probably more on the order of 60 percent. But what we had was a lot of voters who were getting barraged with texts at the last minute. Every Democrat in the state got a text saying Planned Parenthood and Senator Mark Begich say vote no. And so despite those crosswinds, this happened. So that tells me that the support for this is is broader than anyone knows because they should have beat us they should have absolutely why should they have when beat you've you? got when you've got mark begich and mike dunleavy saying vote no and that's just because just because they have the big name because they have the big name right. politician in your state opposed to, but on the one hand they should beat you but on the other hand you were saying you came in with 64 and on the other hand you think that this passes and more alaskans get more of what they want i still want to get back to I, want to, I guess I again want to go back to the, the Planned Parenthood thing. I think what I heard was that there are a lot of pro-choice or Republicans or pro-choice independents that end up voting for Republicans. Wouldn't this help Planned Parenthood be a more impactful organization in the state? What am I missing? So do I believe? I believe it would more closely represent uh, the will of the voter. So if you are a... Um, uh, just call you a one issue candidate and all you want to do is run on um, eliminating a woman's right to choose. I think based on public sentiment in Alaska, that would make you unelectable. I would think that's a good thing. Um, I do know, you know, there was some alignment perhaps of, of Planned Parenthood's concerns with the, you know, maybe with party leaders, but there was one other element to this election reform that we haven't covered, which was we actually put a ban on dark money in our state elections. We couldn't touch federal elections because of the FEC, yeah. but we banned dark money. And we were criticized from, the, from groups on the left and groups on the right. Sure. They're like, this is how we do business. And you're telling us if we spend money on candidate campaigns, we got to disclose where it came from. And the answer was yes. Alaskans and this, have a right to know. And, and this is part of why I appreciate your work and why I appreciate the time. Because like the so same day voter registration initially was killed in California, apparently by political consultants, right? And and. And not because uh, the clients of those consultants necessarily would be harmed. Many of them would have been benefited, uh, but because it would have made it less predictable for those consultants who had figured out how to win under the current context would have made it so they wouldn't necessarily know how to win in the next context. That in fact, status quo power is ends up being in favor of status quo power and and against and against transformation. 
Uh, how else did that, and maybe, and maybe uh, Jonathan, I'll go back to you. How else did you see that, that idea that, that power will aim to preserve itself? Any other examples of that? First of all, push, push back if you didn't see the dynamic that much. I'm, I am projecting that uh, or, or surmising it based on what, I'm, what I've heard. So feel free to push back. But if I'm not wrong, feel free to amplify. And any other examples where somebody you would have thought supported the idea ended up pushing back on the idea? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the dark money provision was, was really sort of exhibit A for what you're speaking to, Jefferson. And I mean, Planned Parenthood was officially opposed to the initiative. And I mean, I'm a pro-choice Democrat. And sure. I think my analysis is actually very similar to Scott's that on the whole, this is going to help empower, you know, say more moderate Republicans or independents who are pro-choice and want to represent the majority of their constituency and the current system does not enable that but i think the dark money provision was a real sticker for them there are a lot of conservation organizations um many of which i you know have really strong dialogue with and 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 know well who were very uncomfortable with the dark money provision as well i I think it's just a, a you know a discomfort with you know changing up um, a status quo system, and it's maybe not totally different from professional licensing, where with professional licensing, if you just license the bejesus out of a profession, it advantages every incumbent in that profession and makes it harder for new entrants. And, um, you know, to some extent, if you think about the electoral system as having incumbents and those being the organizations that know the ropes and know how to play the game and know how to win, when you uh, sort of democratize and add sunshine transparency um it it sort of opens up the playing field a little bit for what it's worth i think planned parenthood and the conservation organizations as well as any organization on the right are going to figure it out under the new system and i think the competition will be more fair and open but um i I think that was the big driver for the opposition and john what about the big labor groups and big business groups when where do they shake out do they stay do they also oppose do they stay out of it yeah, Labor, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but AFL took an officially neutral stance on on the initiative. That said, I know there were sort of uh, diverse opinions within the labor community in Alaska on the initiative, some in support and some very much opposed in opposition. Again, uh, you know, some of it because of this sort of um, game analysis, I guess, you know, on, you know, who's going to end up winning under RCV and then some of it because of the, the dark money prohibition. As far as business groups, you know, I, my impression, and, and Scott, you would know better, but was that you didn't see a, a tsunami of involvement from the business community and, and largely sort of stayed out of it. You may have had, you know, one or two sort of private individuals with, you know, business connections coming out in opposition, but um, I would say they mostly sat out. Does that, would you agree, Scott? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, there were some definitely who, you know, privately saw the advantages because they saw what was happening. Yeah, it seemed to me, it would seem to me that like the standard, you know, Chamber of Commerce, you know, maybe not the Koch brothers, uh, you know, you know, kind of business conservative, the standard Chamber of Commerce conservative would think this is in their interest, right? This had, this had helped them get elected the kind of person that they might want most. Yeah, I made the case in many of those kind of boardrooms and I think made the case well, which was you want a more functional legislature that just gets a after the solutions and doesn't beat its chest, this is what you want. And so we had some element of of that belief gap again, you know, going to business professionals and them going, you are never passing this. So don't put my name on it. And then there was a combination of, well, if I step out on this, I can forget ever getting a meeting with the governor again. So good luck to you. You've got my personal vote. Do not name me in public, Um, which, you know, I'll take it. Every vote counted the same whether it's from a millionaire or a, you know, a worker, you know, working for minimum wage. So what was the fundraising situation for this? How much y'all have to raise for this? How much did you end up raising in order to get your half a point swing or one point win? And what, and what were you up against? So so ultimately we spent um, between six and $7 million. Wow. How Um, many voters, how many voters in Alaska? uh, Over 500,000, 580,000. Okay. I think is the latest number. Yep. Um, and 365,000 voted. Um, but really, there's there's kind of more to that story because one, we had to gather the signatures. That's a cost. Sure. Um, we had to fight the state of Alaska. The attorney general rejected us twice. We had to beat them in Superior Court, beat them in the Supreme Court. Um, we had to monitor the legislative session. 
Um, so like a half million dollars to get on the ballot, half million dollars in lawyers and then and then five to six million dollars in, you know, camp, in ads, basically. Right. And, you know, plus campaign staff. A lot of staff, yeah. um, you know, far less travel than we planned on. But that's roughly correct. Yeah. And, and then what were you up against? What was the and, and I'm not sure the timing of it. So how much of that was sort of dark money and, and not uh, and not counted or maybe counted, but you were not sure where it came from and how much sort of officially from an op- opposition committee? So it came in very late at the end of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no official opposition because I think they thought we weren't going to win at the Supreme Court and so forth. And that happened relatively late. Um, and then it was when people got serious about us at the primary um, the governor's uh, chief uh, strategic political advisor resigned and went to run the campaign. The opposition com- campaign to try to beat yeah, you. Exactly. Got it. Yeah, trying to beat us. And he raised somewhere between a half a million and a million dollars, but that's actually subject to some ongoing campaign finance disputes because they, they broke the law just a little bit. And so we don't really know um, is the short answer. But probably um, in the home stretch, they were probably nearly matching us dollar for dollar at the end because they came in late and it's much easier to sow confusion than it is to sell, you know, a relatively fundamental and on its surface complicated reform. So, but just to see what you were up against, right? Like, you know, spending six plus million dollars in a, in a state with, you know, 500, 600,000 voters, that's, uh, that's a lot. Like how, how, how does that relate to like a go- how expensive a governor's race is in Alaska? About the same expense as a governor's race? Um, yeah, I mean, if you factor in independent spending, um, we had um, the Baggage versus Sullivan race had something like 60 million spent. Holy mackerel. And that's, that was a little bit of our problem. Um, if you saw our campaign, I don't think you'd believe we spent what we spent. Yeah. Because ballot measures like independent expenditure groups get, get charged market rates. Sure. So we had a $1 million TV buy that, you know, ended up costing quadruple. Yeah. Um, and we had to pair it back because as the, you know, the gross, Al Gross, uh, Dan Sullivan race heated up, mm-hmm. the, the independent groups were outbidding us. And unlike a candidate, we can't just say, okay, we get the lowest market rate. So we really, I think we were- And this is, worth dwell, this is worth dwelling on. So I mean, you already said it, but I just want to, uh, so you, candidate campaigns get the, get the preferred pricing treatment. And even if, uh, even if there starts being sort of a bidding war for scarce TV ads during a crowded political season, they still get that. You don't get that benefit. So when there starts being this bidding war, hey, we only got, you know, 60 minutes, only has this many ads. Who wants it, right? And, the, and that starts jacking up the price. You, you suffer from that price. But still, to, to look at that, your you've got recent examples of some um, of some let's say outside the main people winning. Uh, and I don't mean the state of Maine. You have uh, recent examples of popular people losing. You've got a governor that you say is out of step with most uh, with most Alaskans, and you you outraise them as far as we can tell pretty soundly, and have a campaign that's up and running and going pretty soundly. Why was it so close? Just because that initial challenge you faced, because people thought this is crazy, this is new, I don't know what this is, and even if I think it might work, I don't think my neighbors are going to vote for it. Was it really that simple, or what else were you up against? Um, I mean, it really was um, the ability of them to just attack us from the left and the right. So we're, yeah. you know, we're kind of trying to thread a needle in a whirlwind, and they didn't. Towards the end, they didn't even attempt to meet us and debate the issues. They didn't attempt to say. This is why this is better. This is why this is bad. The ads were literally Alaska right to life says vote no. Governor Dunleavy says vote no. Yeah. Alaska Planned Parenthood says vote no. And so people understandably take their cues from organizations they support. Yeah. And so they use proxies you, know, you don't even have a chance to sort of make your case for, for some. For and we voters. saw how um, those impacted us closer to Election Day, because on Election Day, we were down. Uh, I can't remember if it was 13 or 14 percent. And then all the by mail and early votes started getting counted and we closed that gap and then overcame them. Where'd you get the money from? Who are the funders of something like, because as we try to think about building a pro-democracy coalition around the country or state by state, who are the folks that decide to invest in something like this? So it's a little bit, um, you know, we did have, I think over 300 Alaska-based voters or Alaska-based donors rather. Um, You know, it was a small fraction of our funding. Uh, We don't have the population or the wealth to support something like that. Sure. So um, a little bit like venture capitalists, um, I kind of went from one relationship to another, um, targeted folks who had been um, political centrists or groups like Unite America, 
Um, the Arnold Foundation, if you're if you're familiar with them, were a big supporter. And these were groups um, that didn't necessarily politically align with us or have any particular interest in Alaska, but they saw issues like immigration reform or education reform where nothing gets done because of polarization. And so they were willing to invest in basically an idea in order to say, there's a better way to do this. And so um, Catherine Murdoch was one big donor, um, that the Arnold family, uh, Catherine Gale and her foundation. So um, it really was um, just people who care about these reforms and they're a very politically diverse group. It, it's, it's fascinating, um, but it really is people who are like, I think their, their thesis is in the real world, we make our decisions a certain way. And the political system doesn't reflect that reality at all. Giving you binary two choices, and by the way, we've created a system where typically those two choices are as far beyond the margins as possible, is not the way we decide every decision in our life. And yet, that's what we get. Um, and so it's, it's a group of people who are just kind of fed up. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at some of the Massachusetts information, and I do think, you know, we one of the things we looked at was the uh, we interviewed the the virtuous ringleader. Ringleader can sound like a criticism. The the uh, policy entrepreneur in Michigan who worked to pass the uh, redistricting reform initiative there, and one of the big parts of the story, and it was not just it wasn't just like a plucky like a plucky startup effort that like hand writes some notes and puts them on a flagpole, you know, puts them on telephone poles around the people like she had to build a pretty big apparatus. Right. I mean, I think I think that was in the 50 million dollars, uh, 50 million dollar zone and, and looking at some of those folks. So the uh, uh, so in Massachusetts, uh, it was Mark Merrill, who was a member of the board of United America. Uh, Catherine Murdoch, who is the daughter in law of Rupert Murdoch, I think, put in like a million bucks into that one. Uh, the th th that sort of group. And and it seems like there was something at stake for the country. And what happened in Alaska had Alaska and Massachusetts lost some of these folks that you were going out and meeting and saying, hey, you got an extra half a million dollars lying around. You know, you, you want to help us. You want to help us do something. Have you been to Alaska? It's great fishing. Did you enjoy yourself? You want to keep it like that? So you you find those people. So so how many? So the eighty twenty principle. So the, the bulk of that money. You had some you know Alaska based donors, but how many? Is it like a dozen major donors who helped who helped cover half of your thing? Is that about right? Or what would you say the ratio is? Uh, you know, I would say probably over 90% came from that cadre of sort of out of state yeah. election reform advocates. And, and part of that's the reality of being in a low population state. And part of it is, you know, the thing we struggled with, which is, I mean, maybe this has changed in the last couple of months and I suspect it has. I think it has. But, I think that but election think that... reform is not a sexy issue that has a constituency you can go plug into. I right. spent actually the early days and really the first six months of this, was me walking around with the thing I drafted. I was all by myself. Yeah. No funding, sc scraped together a little money to get some help tightening up the legal side, scraped together a little money to get a poll that showed people were ready for this, but really had, uh, you know, I, I'm not, certainly not the means even to gather the signatures, but I spent a lot of time and particularly um, my earliest time was spent with um, Alaska Native organizations. And Alaska Natives here are, 20 some percent of the population, but their political representation is a fraction of that. Yeah. And to some degree, I think they've been in different ways taken for granted by both parties. And all I said, you know, I said, this is a system where there's no barrier to entry anymore. You don't have to put your time in with the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, be married to this person or know that person, like just good candidates running. Um, and it was something that I think that was our our biggest well of support and was certainly more than the difference because we have um, four rural districts in Alaska, um, predominantly Alaska Native. And as those came in, you know, because of infrastructure reasons and otherwise, as their absentee by mail votes came in towards the end, our margins there were over 70 percent. Again and again, I think folks who just saw a stagnant system that wasn't serving them well. Um, and th that's what made me most excited, to be perfectly honest, is maybe now everyone's at the table. 
Well, I want I do want to talk about going forward, but I do, Jonathan. You've been waiting patiently. I do want to go back to you before I do that. I, but I play I played basketball in the in the Aleut and, and Clinkett uh, Community Center in Sitka uh, when I my spring break my senior year in high school. And uh, and so when when you say we got a big uh, amount of support from the from native communities, that can mean voters. It can also mean casino money. Do, is, is that a, is that a uh, is that a um, is that a reality also in Alaska where there are political engines that are fueled by native that, that by tribal casinos or is that is that something that's not a real factor in Alaska? We, we don't we don't have gaming up ga- gaming up here. Although just as an aside, Jefferson, sick is my my hometown, so uh, I'm glad you glad you made it it's up. Beautiful. <laughs> I saw a whale. <laughs> we I didn't see his have, face or her face, but I saw the, the back of him. We have those in abundance, yeah. Um, no, but but uh, I I mean I think the relationship with the native community that that Scott was speaking to, it was just um, driven by, I think the native community wanting representation and the ability to be able to create a coalition of political support around issues important to that community. Sure. And oh yeah, no, I I wasn't saying I wasn't talking about no. motives to be clear, but just that when when you said a, bi- a big amount of support in many western states that do have that aren't Las Vegas, right? That aren't that aren't Nevada uh, who don't have uh, don't have legalized gambling but do have tribal gambling that that ends up becoming one manifestation of potential, potential political power are the are the political action committees uh, for the tribes that are fueled with the with the gaming money. Uh, and but I don't I didn't know the the scenario in Alaska, but it, it seems like I kind of want both your comments on that. Well, first of all, first of all, before I go there, John, anything we've been missing along the way as you were watching the dynamic, uh, anything you've been wanting to get in, but I've been too slow to ask you for your thoughts. The, the only thing I had to elaborate on is Alaska is the only legislative chamber of the 99 in America with a bipartisan coalition that we have in the House of Representatives that we spoke to in the very beginning. And as Scott noted, um, there's a lot of people who recognize, I- including in private, and, and just don't have the political cover to act on it, that a coalition is the best form of governance or results in the best process or results in the best policy and compromise. And the current system is a massive disincentive and a huge threat to anyone who wants to act on what they personally believe would be the best process and approach to the legislative process. And um, there, uh, I mean, in the primary that Scott spoke about where there was just a lot of Republicans, not even moderates, who just got wiped out in the primary, I think, um, I mean, this is, this is really going to be hopefully a sea change going forward in terms of changing the incentive structure and being able to empower coalition governance in the Alaska legislature. So I think that's going to be a, you know, a a massive change going forward, at least from the legislative perspective. And what's happening now, you intimated something just as we were starting. Did some folks just, are are some people cycling out? What's the governing majority looking like going forward in 2021? Yeah, it's a good and complicated question. (laughs) So as, as Scott said, smallest bicameral legislature in the nation, 40 in the house, 20 in the Senate, And right now, there is not a majority formed in either chamber. And so the Senate has 13 Republicans and seven Democrats. And the House, I think going into this election, and Scott, correct me if I get this wrong, but we've got three independents and 16 Democrats. Uh, Bryce, Dan, Calvin, Josiah, four independents. Four independents, yep. (laughs) Uh, 15 Democrats and 21 Republicans, I think, is the tally. So why is that? I mean, to me, I look at that and I say, well, that's a majority of Republicans in both chambers. Uh, but you could have said the same thing the last time. Why? Why is it? And I want to get back to sort of the sort of the big picture landscape. But why is it that that doesn't just create a Republican caucus that runs the House chamber and runs the Senate chamber? Well, yeah, one, it's, one Republican has already declared that she's with the coalition. So now you have a 2020 split um, wow. representative Scoots, who's from wow. Kodiak, who was actually an endorser about measure two. And I will say a, a, a fairly Republican district that went overwhelmingly for ballot measure two, probably because of rep Stutes support. So, I mean, really a lot of these things come down to, you can talk the meta theory. Yeah. A lot of it comes down to personal courage sure. and courage of people like representative Stutes. Yeah. And, and so, do you, so you're at 2020 now, but still, why why are the 
why are a number of and, and previously or I guess it's what it, it, the outgoing majority, the out, outgoing coalition majority. I think you said had five Republicans. Why those five Republicans side of the Democrats rather than saying we can get what we want with our current majority? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is a response to the super hard right policies of our governor, Governor yeah. Dunleavy. And these Republicans are like, this is just not the Alaska that I believe in. And I believe R's and D's and independents working together, working from the middle, working on and from areas of consensus is going to create the best legislative process. And I mean, I think the reason that in the Senate where you have a 13-7 Republican majority and there's still not an outright Republican majority caucus that's emerged is that there's a number of those Republicans who don't just want to sort of create a rubber stamp caucus that's merely just going to ditto whatever policies the governor puts forward. And I think the passage of ranked choice voting um, provides more... um, Understood. They wanted to be a check to the governor. I get that. So now, what, Scott, what representative becomes possible now? What policies, what, what choices become possible now in the ranked choice voting context of Alaska or what things that look like threats you think are much less likely to happen? How does this end up impacting policy results in your state? Yeah, and I and I think it's important to focus on the threats first because I think that's a lot of what uh, Jonathan's getting at is a lot of these Republicans, and, and, a lot, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying Alaska is just a little different in that I think most Alaskans consider themselves much more Alaskan than they do Republican or Democrat. Yeah. No, they might, they they might file themselves- Brexit. I, I'm prepared for them to file Brexit any day now. They might decide. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they do truly consider themselves more Alaskan than American in some sense. Yeah. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. They're not yeah. patriotic, but they have a state patriotism. They don't want to be part of the euro. I get it. <laughs> so when you're a, so say you're a Republican from Fairbanks and that's the seed of the university system. And Governor Dunleavy says, well, you know, that primary, um, you know, that that gem of Fairbanks and uh, the primary um, we're going to gut the funding. Driver, yeah, we're going to gut it. What do you do when you're a Republican? Are you a Fairbankson? Are you an Alaskan or are you a Republican? Brexit, baby. And, so, and, and then you've got the same thing, you know, coastal Republicans. We're going to gut the ferry system. If you're a coastal Republican like Louise Stutes, do you stick with your district or do you stick with the governor? And so that's the strain. And the biggest issue we see right now is Alaska has the permanent fund, which is essentially, we took a portion of our oil revenues and we made a huge endowment, biggest sovereign wealth fund in the country. And we fund most of our government now, just off the earnings from that endowment. The current governor, believe it or not, um, as conservative as he says he is, um, says we should just um, start doing some one-time payouts. Let's just start taking money out of that thing. Let's cut government on one hand Let's send all Alaskans huge checks on the other hand. It's, it's kind of pure populism. Yeah. And those fiscally conservative Republicans are saying, you're going to spend our seed corn. You're going to blow through our retirement account for a, for a trip to Disney World. That's not the kind of Republican I am. And so we have this, this DNA that some of these Republicans are going back to, of the, I'd call the Ted Stevens DNA, yeah. which is he, he famously said, to hell with politics, just do what's right for Alaska. And he, he lived that, you know, his yeah. best friend in the Senate was Daniel Inouye, a Democrat from Hawaii, because sure. the, the non, you friend know, of my the grandfather's. Non-contiguous, yeah, the non-contiguous uh, state should stick together. Uh, Joe Biden was another great friend. And so that, you know, it's just kind of a question of which the non-contiguous the stick together. They were going to do Brexit together. That was the plan, huh? And we lived <laughs> and Ted Stevens stuck around. They were yeah, going we to go down to 48. Flight. We'd be lobbying Puerto Rico just to have a, uh, an even number again. So, uh, let me ask uh, Scott. Same question. Any any priorities of yours or priorities of the states that you think are now more possible, or any threats that you see in addition to what Scott was saying? Um, oh, were you talk- was that to Jonathan or to John? Me? I meant sorry. Jonathan. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. N- no, no, no. I, I I would I would echo what Scott said, and I think a lot of it is you're you're just sort of uh, adjusting the threat landscape politically speaking to elected officials and. And, and just being able to remove obstacles for them to do what they know is the right thing is hugely, hugely important. And certainly in the eight years in the legislature and increasingly in the last couple of years, my perception is that's one of the best things that we can do is remove obstacles for elected officials to do what they know is the right thing. 
I, I want to go back to the fundraising part. I want to go back to sort of the entrepreneurial part of doing this, right? That this this an initiative begins because people start doing it. It's like starting a little company, right? And and it's it would be you know like crowdfunding companies. In my judgment, is a is a wonderful development. The more traditional way to start a company is to find a handful of angel investors and then eventually some venture capital investors and move forward from there. And you identified sort of that the, the United America folks, Catherine Murdoch, et cetera, sort of those seed funders that, that got you, you know, 90 percent of your resource. And what I said was, Get, you know, it happened in Massachusetts, it happened in Alaska, had both of them failed, that might have given some of them pause. Well, I guess maybe we're not going to be pushing them. So I think for people who are wanting ranked choice voting, it's a big deal that Alaska won by half a point or by a point rather than losing. I think that's a big deal. At the same time, I do think you said that, uh, that there isn't sort of this built-in funding constituency or necessarily built-in activism or voting constituency for democracy reform, right? It's, it's sort of a, been too often an afterthought. Talked about health care. Well, you've got some health care organizations. Talked about women's right to choose. You've got, you've got lots of political power already built up. But it does seem like in 2021 going forward, there'll be a lot of people who prioritize democracy early. And that's been you know sort of my, my argument for a while and there need to be. Scott, is that, am I Pollyanna? Is that your, is that your hope or is that even your impression? And if you were going to go out and try to help another state do it, do you think they would have an easier chance building early power than you had? Yeah, I think so. I think it's exactly as you say. And I've, I've had some conversations actually, as you'd imagine with uh, folks around the country, probably 10 or 12 states I've spoken with now whether it be by ballot measure in the half the states that allow that and others going to their legislature, but they, it's, it's a little spark of hope. You know, Alaska, a stereotypically quote unquote red state has done this. We can do it too. Um, and it's, I, I, I would ask people to look to the youth because boy, if you saw the numbers I saw in terms of younger voters, where the future is headed, they're all into it. Yeah. D's, R's, I's, um, you know, the, it was cr- sort of the crusty old um, operatives who are against us. And the young folks were like, absolutely, sign me up. So um, where so next? That's where the future. Yeah, where next? It, 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 presumably it need to be because most eastern states don't have a ballot initiative system. So you can't do it uni- you know, uniformly around the country. There is no federal initiative system. So you're not going to be able to override Congress to do it federally. There are a bunch of western states. What are the states you look at and say, oh, that's a state I bet could put it on the ballot and pass it? So th- there are a few, um, you know, Florida, as, as many people don't know, has ballot measures. Um, and they actually ran something on open primaries this past time and they failed, but only because they had to amend the constitution. So they got north of 57%, but needed 60. And that was not a well-funded campaign. And yet they came that close in a presidential year. So that, that would be an example. I'd look at the, the state of Oregon, yeah. who is, you know, it's dominated by progressives for sure, but has extreme legislative dysfunction because some elements of the legislature are so extreme, for example, and you probably know this well, you know, if Republicans don't like a bill that's on the floor, they move they to Idaho appara- for like they'll, two they'll weeks. They'll go to Idaho. Yeah. Right. They'll go to Idaho to prevent Maybe fishing anything. in Alaska. I don't know. Right. And that's not democracy, right? So people are to some degree fed up. Now you have to build this weird coalition as we did. You know, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have won if we didn't have a lot of Democrats with us. We wouldn't have won if we couldn't have taken a big chunk of Republicans. So you really have to cobble it together and you can never make it partisan ever. And so you just have to be honest with people. This is a better decision-making process. I'm not going to extrapolate for you that your favorite person is going to get elected Senator. I'm not going to do that. What I am going to do is tell you, this is a better system that represents the most people. A dear friend of mine who runs a small electric car company in our town, uh, whose dad was our Republican attorney general and, and came within a third party uh, campaign of maybe being governor of our state. Most would say probably being governor. Uh, his name is Mark Fronmeyer. His his big cause is star voting, essentially an altered version of ranked choice voting. Where instead of you ranking one, two, three, four, five, you give people, you know, it's like Yelp voting, right? Say, I, I think there's a nine star candidate or a five star candidate. I think this is a two star candidate. And then and then the rest of the mechanism works pretty similarly to to ranked choice voting. Is that something you've looked into? Because I do think there is going to be significant fuel 
for democracy reforms going forward. I think it's a hot issue. It's one that that people are, uh, that anybody trying to use the word Trumpism, I think it goes deeper than one person. But this dynamic that has uh, that has people just captured within an almost cult-like, uh, barricaded around kind of non-free speech zone of shared thought or lack thereof. Like, I think I think that's a growing bipartisan, transpartisan priority to disrupt and to change the dynamic. Uh, and if you and if you look, look at the big sort, it was one thing where you had like southern conservatives and northern liberals across party lines. But now with the political sort, you know, it, it, it can be hard to run a country if the objective of one party is merely to block the other. I think people are going to be looking to block it. But out of just curiosity, is star voting something you'd uh, you've already seen or should I connect you with Mark Fronmeyer? <laughs> You know, we, it is something we looked at. We looked at several different systems, but one thing we started with fundamentally, um, first of all, there has to be trust to the voters. And what they didn't want to see is a system where um, somehow the ballots go into a computer and the algorithm decides who won. People kind of fundamentally rejected that. Yeah. Um, the other thing we have is in Alaska, we have some of the most secure elections in the country because we have a paper ballot and we preserve those ballots. We don't do the machines. They go through scanners, sure, for tabulation. And so we settled on ranked choice because I could explain it. Yeah. I could say, okay, you got 10 votes in this election. One candidate's got, uh, you know, one candidate's got four, another candidate's got four. This candidate has two. How do you count them? You pick up the two ballots and you look at what their next selection is. It's, you can count them by hand. It's that secure. As opposed to, you know, star voting, which I think is intuitive, but a little more exotic. Um, we just kind of felt like simpler and more transparent was better. Now Alaska joins uh, Maine in allowing ranked choice votes to be used in presidential elections. Does that mean you've been a caucus state, right? I think a friend of mine participated in Alaska caucuses or did I make that up? We we were a caucus state on the Democratic side until this cycle and Got the it. Democratic Party switched from caucus to basically RCV. Got it. And so, so the party moved to rank choice voting within the party. The Democratic Party apparatus decided that's how we're going to pick our nominee. Right. Yeah, exactly. In fact, I, I remember in 2016, the caucus happened um, when I was in Juneau for session. And you can't participate in a caucus if you're not in your uh, community where you're registered to vote, which for me is Sitka. So I wasn't even able to participate in the 2016 Democratic primary process, which <laughs> I did not enjoy being disenfranchised. So uh, I was very much a supporter of switching to RCV for the Democratic Party primary. Was that part of your effort? Was getting the Democratic Party to do it and to get them used to it? Was that part of this overall effort or was that just sharks and dolphins, right? Similar dorsal fins, but different genetic <laughs> roots. Well, I, I I think there was some crossover and, and Scott probably can speak to that somewhat, but there was very much an organic effort coming out of 2012 and 2016 and just the inherent dysfunction of caucuses and standing around in the gym and sorting yourself in corners and if you aren't there on the right day you don't get to participate and low participation rates and you know it being in, inhibiting participation of those who aren't as able-bodied I mean down the list and so there was a long list of people within the progressive world who were just like let's move out of the 1800s and move into the 21st century that said I think in the 2020 uh, RCV process that the Democratic Party conducted, there was, I think, sharing of best practices, but but I think Scott knows more on that front. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to claim credit for getting that to happen, but it, we certainly didn't have any involvement. Um, but we did actually connect them with some out-of-state resources in order to get it to run smoothly, because the last thing we could have is have it be a right. debacle. Right. And they had, you know, they had twice their normal turnout. It was a resounding success, including, you know, Senator Begich saying it was a wonderful experience. And so I think we benefited certainly from that disconnect of saying, well, it's good enough for us, but don't give that to the public. I think certainly there were some people who, who, could, who could live with that cognitive dissonance, but I think others said, no, I have to be honest, that was a good experience and that's a better way to do things. Now, I want to go back to the party makeup going forward. We'll just, no, just no, you know, another question or two before we wrap. The, uh, and by wrap, I mean uh, say rhyming words to a beat. Uh, when uh, so if 55 percent of the voting population or, you know, give or take, right, maybe it's closer to 60 percent are registered, not affiliated or members of, you know, sort of micro, very small parties. And what is it, like a quarter of Republicans and like 10 to 15 percent are registered Democrats. But still, it, do I have those numbers roughly right? 
I want to say it's something like 23, 24 Republican, 13 or 14 Democrat. OK, um, but but nonetheless, when you were breaking down or when Jonathan was breaking down the composition of the legislature, most the vast majority of legislators were either Democrats or Republicans. Do you yeah. think this system means there will be more non-affiliated legislators in the uh, in the Alaska legislature? Jonathan, what's your impression? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question, Jefferson. Actually, after this November election, consulted with our legislative librarians, and there are four independents in the House of Representatives who have been elected out of 40. So that's 10% of the chamber. You know, project that on Congress and imagine if there were 43 or 44 registered independents in the U.S. House of Representatives. Yeah. So proportionally, that's not child's play. No, it's, it's also a real the- thing. It's the highest number since statehood. So this, we're at an all-time high watermark in Alaska legislative history in terms of independent participation. And if I were to guess, going forward, especially with passage of ranked choice voting, we will only see that number increase. I mean, it would seem like it could double quickly, right? I mean, if over half, I, mean, it, I, I guess there is a question of where do you get your first 15 percent? Where do you get first 25 percent? Where do you get your first endorsements? Where do you get your first 10 grand? Right. I, like I, I recognize that those that those challenges will persist. Uh, but as you think about how folks caucus up, I mean, I guess you're already exemplifying it, right? There's already kind of this coalition idea. If you just build the share of independence, there would just be a new sort of caucus formation, a new governing coalition formation with more independence. Is there anything else people should be aware of about the dynamics of that when they think, well, you know, two party system might suck, but it exists and we know what it is. And it offers sort of like the discussion that Scott was having about uh, rank choice voting versus star voting. At least people understand what it is. It might have downsides. At least people understand it. Anything you'd want to say either to let people understand what to be concerned about, how to solve it or to quell their concerns? I mean, I, I think the the existence of a block of independence in the legislative context is massively helpful. I mean, from within, you know, private conversations among legislators in the Capitol. Sorry, but I'm being noise here. I'm in SeaTac, but um, uh, I would say independents, broadly speaking, are the sort of heat sink for political passions and and sort of ideological crusades, and often recenter our caucus on sort of the mean and median of what Alaskans care about um, because they just don't have any sort of extraneous interests. I mean, and um, so I, I, I think it's a, it's a great centering mechanism for legislative caucuses to have that block of independence, even if they're not, you know, numerically overwhelming in force, but have a sub, like a critical mass threshold to be influential in the deciding faction within a caucus. And I hope I'm tracking the trajectory of your question, Jefferson. Forgive me. Yeah, it was sort of a compound question. I mostly just wanted to get you talking. <laughs> uh, Scott, any any closing word you have? Anything I should have asked that I didn't? Or thoughts how you, again, either, any more about how this is going to play out going forward or what you might be doing next? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would, I would go reflect on what uh, Jonathan just said about, um, you know, four or five, six uh, independents in the state house. That's not nothing. 20, 30, 40 in the, in the House of Representatives, they become the fulcrum for good and for ill. Um, yeah. They can prevent extreme things from happening because one party has a slim majority. They can also empower good things to happen because the party in the minority is trying to prevent anything from happening. And I think it's really kind of the key to our political future. One of our most effective things we had, um, we had a cartoonist who worked with the campaign. He was a supporter and he did a pie chart. These are Alaskans politically, and this is what the representation looks like. And as you can imagine, giant giant chart of independence with very small slices for d's and r's but when you look at their representation that's not been the case so it's it's a little ray of hope it's a little it's a little something that's going to allow people to be truer to who they are and and i don't think people should sleep on the fact either that i think this is going to change the behavior of existing officials forget about who we're going to elect in two years we have um right now we haven't organized either body because frankly, because people are talking about working with people of the other party. And I don't see how that could be a bad thing. Is this a, does this mark the decline or even, you know, an early death of political parties? I mean, it, presumably this will change primaries. It will change the maybe end political primaries, uh, at least probably state funded political primaries. Maybe there'd still be some sort of endorsement process within the parties. What's the impact on parties? I mean, parties are important. Uh, you know, parties represent a bundle of values, but they also become an exclusive club apart from those values, as we've seen with Trumpism. 
Does a lot of what's going on have to do with the values of the candidates that he targets? No, not really. It has to do with sort of individual loyalty. So it's just going to kind of broaden things up. Now, it's still going to be important that a party and a party endorsement is going to be a valuable thing. It represents a, a, a large, significant swath of people. They have funding mechanisms. Um, but why should political parties have powers exclusive of groups of Alaska Natives, groups from labor, other interest groups? They shouldn't, they, they uniquely in the landscape got to act as gatekeepers to the ballot and that's over. And so they're gonna be important. They're gonna be an important part of our civic life. And I'm sure I'm gonna work with party people from both parties, but they're not gonna veto anymore good people moving forward with good policies. Scott Kendall, author, one of the principal authors of the Alaska Ranked Choice Voting Ballot Initiative, which won by a couple whiskers, and Jonathan Christ Tompkins, who represents Sitka, the 35th District, and Alaska's House of Representatives. Thank you both so much for joining us, and thank you so much for your work, man. It was fun to talk to you. Yeah, thank you, Jefferson. Thanks, Jefferson. Really enjoyed it. Hope we have a chance to talk again. We'll have a chance to follow up and see how it plays out. You be well.